like, hey, I know, you know, yada, yada is getting fired. Uh, can I take his, you know, can I take a job? I didn't know what I was doing. My roommate who I met through doing security knew all this stuff, you know, did like huge gigs and stuff for Elenium and all this stuff. And he was like, dude, just say you know how to do it. I'll teach you how to do it. It'll, it'll be fine. So I was like, all right, you know, and just went in there. I was like, I know how to do this. And he somehow, you know, the guy got fired, gave me the job. And then I was just like ducking behind corners and being like, hey, how do I? Oh, I turn on the sound on the second floor. He's like, yeah, this is that, you know, kind of just learned on the job, just doing it. You know, like, that's literally how experience teaches that I am the, you know, example of that when it comes down to this job was that's how I learned how to do lights and visuals and production and get into all that was just, um, working at a place called club vinyl here and just kind of learning all that and just, asking questions and looking things up and seeing what I want to learn. And yeah, so did security for about a year, year and a half and just kind of gravitate into people I've met and opportunities and taking advantage of the opportunity and just, um, yeah, just kind of diving headfirst into that. You're listening to the free of free of free of music music podcast to the free of music podcast. Rothschilds and by the time this podcast comes out my name is my performing name is going to be Northern Form uh, I was going as Andrew Rothschild uh, for since the last handful of years so about now and I am out of Denver Colorado well that's a that's a big fork in the road so let's uh we could just Dive right into that, or I could hit you with a ridiculous question. Your choice. Um, either one. Okay. The ridiculous question it is, is the beginning of the note or the end of the note more important? Beginning of the note of like a single note? Yeah. Oh, wow. The sound. Um, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one because it's different. Because the beginning of the note is the attack, which it just depends on the kind of sound you're going for because a pad has no attack for example it's the bottom of the note you know so um i don't know i would say maybe the beginning of the note when it comes down to prominent melodies and the end of the note when it comes to textures (laughs) nice nice well 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 played that was a political answer you got you got you did that one well nice no you i agree though um it is interesting uh one of the songs of yours in particular and we just jump into that one uh locked up
that there's a I want to say like a little sample that gets repeated and like locked in and it's about halfway through like two minutes 30 seconds or so and it sounds I don't know exactly what the sample is but it sounds like it's saying you 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 yeah you you and that tail of that that short sample seems to be like 45 seconds and it it is a bold thing because it's only like a half note that's like yeah. so prominent and then it just fades out and it's changing the whole time yeah. so how do you work with that kind of tail end on a texture because at first it's very prominent and then it becomes a yeah texture. so um in that sense they really so a lot of people throw reverb on a lot of things but reverb can get actually pretty technical as you can time the pre-delay and the post delay through like a millisecond based off the BPM, which it kind of sinks into it. So if you, there's a lot of people who will just like use reverbs and I myself did that for the longest time. And so I figured it out was you can BPM sync the reverb through a little like calculating. And so in that sense, I timed the reverb to kind of go with the beat. Also, there's another time, I forget exactly what I did there because I probably created it like a couple of years ago, but it was either that or um, I also re, like I'll have like the clip and the reverb and then I will record the reverb on another track. So then I have just like the tail end of that clip and then you can do whatever you want with it. You can synthesize it, you can side chain it, which is something I'll do a lot, which would be like, you know, people try to, over overcomplicate pads sometimes and textures and really you can just kind of resample a reverb like sometimes a lot of my pads would just be like a guitar or something just fully 100 percent wet on reverb and just i'll just have that in the back and sculpt it up you know and just no not make it so messy and um yeah so there's a couple things that i do with uh you know resampling the tail of reverb but mostly if you have BPM syncing it and like sometimes looping it or just straight up recording it, resampling it from another track and kind of just turning into a whole nother instrument in a sense. If that makes sense. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Appreciate you diving into that a little bit. So tell me about that song. What, how, what was behind it? How did you create it? Uh, what was like the foundation? Um, origin story. I'm trying to remember because, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, I think if I remember the song, I kind of started off with kind of like a creepy, kind of like a tiptoe thing, if I remember correctly. Um, and then I kind of break it off into this insane crescendo. Well, the intention, I don't, yeah, I don't exactly remember. It's mainly it's always just to get like a, a rise out of someone, you know, it's all emotion. So, and a lot, even in my bio or whatever, it's, I kind of describe my music as like starting someone laying down into or sitting down. And then at the end of the song, you're like kind of like flying in a sense. I've not something I purposely done. It's not something I sat down. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to do this. It's just something I've always naturally gravitated to, which was just kind of this giant crescendo where like the more the song goes, the more intense it goes. And Sometimes I get a little insecure by it because maybe I'm like, dang, it's a little too intense at this part. You know, I'm supposed to be making chill music, you know, forget about genres. But yeah, you're like, the brand is chill music. And I'm kind of by the end of the song, it's like so many instruments and it's just like everything's going kind of crazy and it gets a little intensive. Um, so yeah, that was definitely with the lock though. It was kind of like to be this, I don't even know like a setting to put it, but it was just kind of starts as like this creepy kind of like, slow thing and then it just kind of crescends into this very like high energy kind of flying thing kind of the same vibe i did with utopia which by the end of utopia it's just going insane you know i have the vocals kind of looping and you know so kind of the same approach yeah so utopia in particular so that's another one that i wanted to talk about
definitely has it feels like it's one movie yeah. it's a it's a build and then of course yeah. it ends but it is uh it's a progression and it feels like it's cohesive so when you're adding all those layers and kind of experimenting it's it's building out that song how do you know when to add another one how to mix it in <laughs> how to find its place i don't even know sometimes like you know if you that's kind of the danger with working on a song for too long because you'll be sitting there and you'll be like you know that's why recently i've been trying to kind of finish songs or a lot faster because pro pro noia that all before that that was me working on handfuls of songs for about two years a year and a half and that's just me and then i realized i just wasn't changing the song at all i was just making it different because I got, I was sick, not sick of it, but let's just say for the easy sake of term, I was sick of it, you know, cause I've just been listening to it for months and months and months. And then I go to it and I'm like, I'm personally like bored with it. Cause I've listened to it for hours, you know, and then my mind naturally will want to be like, well, I'll change it. And I'll be like, well, this is better. Different is better, you know? And that's kind of a toxic mindset. I remember one time with utopia, I actually, change the vocal at the end like the main part when it's like you could feel so good no in it you know that i had that for a while and i actually changed it and i went to my friend and my fr i was i show my friend and she's like so i like the old one better the one that i kept with and i was like what are you talking about you know i was like there's a new one so much better she's like not at all like but i was just like i just made it on the spot it was new to me so i was like this is so cool you know and I was so sick of the old yeah. ones. So, um, yeah, it comes down to like when you sit on it, more or less, so when you sit on a song for too long, you just kind of naturally just want to keep throwing things on it, you know? So that's something I don't purposely do, you know, or even know, like sometimes I'll like catch myself, just I'll come back to a song, maybe I'll work, working on it late at night and I'll be like, what are all these like, like, it'll just be like a lot. You know, but like, I can't even, you know, focus on one element right now. So I kind of find myself kind of pigeonholing in a sense. So really it's just kind of, you know, adding stuff. You think it sounds good or whatever. And then you walk away and you come back, you know, or you know, walk away for a few hours a day, two days, you know, maybe sometimes even a month, you know, even there's songs I've gone back to after a year and you just re-listen to it. And if your brain can, take it in and not, you know, I'm not forcing you. And then I know it's good, you know? So yeah, it's actually a good question. It's just tough of where, you know, I'm always like, is this boring or am I just, you know, like, is this boring? I need to add more or is it perfect? And I've just listened to it a million times, you know? So it's actually yeah. a never ending battle. Could, because your brain can always come up with new yeah. ideas and more ways to tweak yeah. things or take what's already there and, run it through a different compression, you know, exactly. whatever, something. So, yeah, so that you kind of unintentionally answered another question I have, which is when a, when a song is done. And is it fair to say when you, it seemed like when you reapproached the song and you felt like you could take it in and enjoy it, then it was done? Is that what um, you said? Yeah, pretty much. Like, honestly, it just really comes down to if I can walk away and then listen to it and still be engaged and just you know just keep walking away you know like because there's a lot of times where i think a song is done and then i will come back and listen to it a week later and i'll be like well no way it's not even close to done you know so um it's always hard you know and it's also there's this thing um actually i heard this on like a south park like um like documentary where they make an episode in like six days and it was all about how they made episodes really fast and someone was like, you ever get annoyed by how like fast you make the episode? And he goes, oh, not at all. He's like, we can work on the same episode for a year based on how our minds work. He's like, and it might be 20% better if that, you know, maybe even worse because we've micromanaged it into the ground. It was like, he's like he likes having, well, they like having six days to get an episode out and then it's like out there, you know? So it definitely comes down to, yeah. that's something I've been working on a lot more lately is just not sitting on a song for too long. Like if I like it, you know, just kind of get it out because I can sit there and work on it for three years and I'm not really doing anything. I'm just kind of taking the same song and changing it 18 million times. And, and it's, it's seen like 50 different song versions and I ended up just releasing the last one, you know. 
So it really comes down to a maturity point for me where I'm like, all right, dude, just, it's done. You know, stop changing it. Instead of you changing this one, just make another one, you know? And then, you know, so it's like, that's something I learned with Pronoia, the whole EP, where it was just like, I worked on th those songs for like a year and a half to two years, you know? And then I realized I was like, I could have made, I did, all I did was change every song about 40 times. Every song is like 40 variations of what it was, you know? And it's like, that's something I'm trying to do better about with just being like, okay, it's done, you know? And let's just make another song instead of, running this one into the ground. That that kind of leads nicely into some other questions I have, which is, do you struggle with perfectionism? And if so, what strategies do you use to actually like let it go and know that like, sure, I could change it 10,000 more times, but like, um, this has got to live. I don't know. It's not really like a, like a check mark, you know, necessarily where I'm like, okay, I hit this notch, it's done. It's really just a mental thing. A lot of times I'll possibly with a song, I feel like it's done. I will A, B it with a song that I love, you know, like, uh, let's say like a Bonobo song, for example, like I'll compare one of my songs to like Sapphire and I'll be like, I'll try to engage, I'll try to like gauge if one is busier than the other, you know, cause sometimes with me, with my art, I've seen it all through and out. I've, you know, I know everything I've done. It's like making, you know, making a movie, you've seen every scene behind and back. It's like loses its magic. So with my music, it's like no magic for the most part. I mean, there is after a while when you when you stop in the studio and then mixing it and then listening to your car and different headphones and coming back and making minor detail changes, you know, like after a while it comes back. But in the middle of like the mixing phase and or like ready to stamp it, I'll like A-B it and I'll be like, for example, like Sapphire by Bonobo, i have use that song a bit and I'll be like, wait, this song is just as minimal. You know, I think my song, I was like, oh, maybe it's too minimal, but really it's just right. I've just listened to it so many times. I've just, I'm so used to all the elements and when they come in, it's like nothing's a shock value. So I was like, oh, like Sapphire seems boring right now when I AB it with this one as well, you know? So maybe that is just me overanalyzing it and just wanting to be like more, 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 you know? And less is more is like a really true statement, you know? So it's really just um, yeah, tell that me. sense, yeah. Tell me about negative space in music and spacing out sounds. Yeah. Um, well, there's different styles because it's definitely like a call and response style, which is more like a dubstep thing. I've, uh, you know, just been messing with that when I'm bored and it's cool. My music is more just, you like evolving, you know, in a sense where it's like you're taking the same elements and then you're adding more and it's just kind of turning into this whole story where like, dubstep and stuff like that for example it's call and response where it's like noise kicks their noise kicks their noise and it's just kind of like a walk where mine's kind of like yeah like a crescendo thing uh i've been trying you know it's just a different style it's like not something i think one's better than the other it's literally just a completely different vibe you know it's like apples and oranges to me in a sense when it comes down to those two styles but with negative space I've been trying to kind of keep that more of my music and then kind of adding more like bass, but not like dubstep, but like just like a sub, you know, I'd be like noise, noise, and then like a sub, you know, kind of fill in. And then it's like, that's kind of more where I, uh, I'm focusing on like my negative space aspect where it's just kind of like using kind of bass more to fill, fill in the gaps, I guess. And not just always have like melodies kind of, you know, weaving back and forth, you know, just let it breathe a little bit more. But it's just a, an artist's integrity. I don't think one's better than the other. It's just uh, it's just different, you know. Well, I certainly do appreciate the the warm lows, the like the subs yeah. that you that you put in. They're not like um, overly aggressive. You certainly need a sub to to understand it and to like you know have access to the full range of the yeah. song. When you are starting from scratch, you're moved on. You've you've released a song, or you've just if you're going to start fresh today, what do you do first? Um, you would just find a basic, like a, not basic, but like a bass element to go off of. Um, either that be guitar, either that be, you know, a synth sound, either that be a melody of whatever sort, kind of that just kind of is like the first step. And then I, that's going to be the theme of my song most of the time, you know? So like, okay, this is such a catchy melody. I'm going to start off here 
you know, and then, you know, maybe bring in some tops, bring in some pads, and then bring in the kick, you know, the kick, and then bring in the sub, and then bring in some, like, chopped up vocals, and then add a couple more elements, you know, but a lot of times it always has, like, a main theme, and then, uh, like, that main theme is usually the thing that kind of sticks around for the entire song, and then other things just come and go supporting it, in a sense, you know, it's like, um, another el- another melody, another melody, and they'll kind of go away, another one will come back, another vocal chop will come in, but there's still that main, like, you know, chunk of theme that's kind of just riding along through the entire song. So, yeah, it's definitely the first step is finding a, a big theme, and it's usually an instrument, not a vocal, not a drum, not like a pad or anything like that. It's always like a, a strong melody with either a synth or a hang drum or um, a guitar or i mean anything in that sense you know so yeah nice and it's usually nighttime as well cool. too. <laughs> i don't really yeah, I, yeah i don't make much music during the day even though i want to but just i just it just nice. feels so much better at night yeah well so some of those tracks certainly feel like energizers like that that you could stay up all night <laughs> you know listening to it for <laughs> yeah. sure and uh, I'm sure you yeah. do, and uh, I'm sure others do too. Tell me about that though. Having that kind of steady downbeat on some of your tracks, kind of have that forward momentum and energy added. Uh, how do you, you know, balance keeping the energy going? Because if it's you know night, kind of high energy <laughs> style, but you're also balancing that with minimalistic yeah. textures and soft things. Mm, I think it's more so adding just a little bit more extra drums. You know, I mean, that's kind of the main thing. It's like, you know, you start off with a kick and then like, you know, a snare and stuff. And then I usually try to bring in the sub and the kick at different times. So like, I've, you know, a lot of the times, like it'll just at the drop, it'll just be kick and snare or kick and uh, bass. So I like bringing the kick in and then it kind of gives another ear. It's kind of just introducing because it's, it, you know, it's kind of throwing, if you throw all your like ingredients on the first beat, the people don't have to like nothing to, I mean, A, it's going to be overwhelming. B, it's very hard to like climax off of that in a sense, you know? So I kind of like bringing in basic layers and just introducing them every eight to 16 bars, you know? So it keeps the person like, Oh, there's another thing, you know, it keeps them engaged. You know, they know it's changing. It's not ever floating. Like a lot of house music. That's something I've been trying to do more though, is let my music, kind of just float and stay steady more but i just find myself not wanting to do it like i can you know go listen to uh a, you know organic house song you know and you know no discredit to organic house and that whole vibe like i love that stuff but i'll i won't even notice but i'll be listening to the same exact thing for like 45 seconds straight like nothing changes but i'm just like you know marching along but i try to do that in my studio and i'm just like bored you know it's like very interesting so I always have I always yeah. have to subconsciously or you know I always have to keep it you know evolving. So in that sense, that usually it's just taking a lot of simple layers, and even if it's minimal, the the ear notices it. You know, even if I do another sixteen bars and I just add a couple bongo wax in the sides of the ears, you know, it's still something different. Your body recon your ears recognize it's something different, and it keeps you engaged in a sense. You know, it's like. Sometimes it's just enough to be different. You're still grooving to the main theme, but yeah, it's still it's still something a little bit different, just to kind of keep it different, keep it engaging. Rather than your music sounding like it's kind of like a stair step um, up, like you're suddenly adding a new thing and then it doesn't change for 16 bars. It, I feel like you're uh, changing. Maybe it's the um, automation or some other elements between the introduction of new sounds to kind of smooth those yeah. um, it's not, 16 bar It's not ever a black and white thing. Uh, there's many ways to do that. For, yeah, for example, you can even just start, which I've done plenty of times, is I'll you know mess with the wet and dry on the reverb, for example, where it just starts getting turned more into a pad as it goes and then it cuts off and keeps going. You can do that with, you know, a side chain, you, you can really do it with anything. You add a little bit of distortion, just keep adding it. So um, that's not a black and white thing I ever kind of like, you know, go off of. It's just all in the moment and being like, you know, oh, this would be cool if, 
you know, this guitar gets washed out by a lot of reverb at the end, you know, and then it cuts back, you know, so definitely different or like panning, you know, that's even another big thing. Like sometimes I'll be in the left ear and then like, I'll be like, all right, I'm going to gradually put it to the right ear on this, like right where it crosses over into the next eight bars, you know? And then it's like, whoa. And it's like, it sounds like a new sound. It's really not, you know, it's just pan to your right ear. And then it's like, sounds like a whole nother way, you know, it's uh but yeah, there's never like a black and white thing where I'm like on a whiteboard, you know, I'm like, all right, this is where I do, you know, it's just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just gotcha. uh, many different ways. But yeah, a lot of automation. That's definitely a very easy trick to not sounding, um, you know, clear cut is just taking little things and just adding automation to it can honestly make it, you know, totally uh, personal and unique. I guess is a better way to put it. What are your favorite software instruments, VSTs, plugins? Duh. Um, so instruments, not like effects, um, or, or effects either. Or. Yeah. Well, I got my, like, I got my guitars. I have a Moog, uh, sub 37, which is, um, super awesome. Super good bang for your buck. If you're looking for sub, <laughs> not paid for this. Um, I have my hang drums. These are all analog gear. So inside the box, um, I have so many synths. It's like, I don't even know what to do. Uh, I have Omnisphere. How about just a sh- a short list of favorites, or that okay. you sometimes go right. to? I'll just do know. like go do yeah. Omnisphere is like a thing that has so many synths. It's insane. I use Serum for a couple different things. I have um, Vital, Silence, <laughs> Match. <laughs> I have Contact. You know, it's a bunch of different things. I never find myself when it comes to like instruments i don't find myself running to a, a synthesizer right away if i need a reverb i'm going to valhalla if i need an eq or like i need mixing things i'm going to fab filter if i want distortion i'm going for either the uh ableton or i'm going for um uh decapitator by sound toys you know if i want pitch bending i'm going a little alter boy you know so when it comes to instruments, I don't really have a certain one that I run, a certain synth that I run to right away for sure. When it comes to everything around that, I have definitely the my go tos for sure. Where um, nice, yeah. I I appreciate you you diving into those like niches of like what you do, and then you know the plugin family that you'd use. Yeah. You know? How do you stay organized when you are? downloading so many various plugins, creating so many files. Do you have any strategies, hacks that you've learned over the years? Um, yeah, when Black Friday comes around, don't just buy a bunch of plugins. Because I have I found myself doing that where it's just like, well, this plugin is usually 500 bucks and it's on sale for 80 on Black Friday. You know, I won't even need it. I'll just buy it just to buy it. That's a very, a very um, toxic thing that I've done. Um, you know, it's like the whole, the you know, the mechanic blames his, you know, tools for a shoddy job, this and that. How do you know which ones yeah, you need you can, it, it, you know. I'll tell you exactly what <laughs> So this is a fluke, actually, but about like a, two months ago or a month ago, I don't know what happened, but I lost all of my plugins on my studio computer. Oh, so that's shit. like thousands of dollars of plugins that I've accumulated. And... It's actually a really funny question. I literally just, uh, <laughs> I just went through all my songs that I've been working on. And then in like Ableton will be like, you're missing. Like, oh, I've used this one. You're I've missing this, this plugin. So I'll be like, well, I use yeah. that one. And that's a good question. So the ones that I've had so many, like, I had a lot of bunch of waves plugins of different reverbs and delays and, you know, EQs and different, you know, kick plugins and this and that. So, when I lost all my plugins and about, you know, freaked out. So I was like, and I'm not the most organized person. So every website has its own login information and this and that and presets, which was actually, I lost a handful of presets, but it, it was fine. Cause a lot of the ones I just end up using anyways, were, you know, ones I know how to make. Found myself, I had a lot of serums. I had a lot of, uh, and also, even though I got, like, I just got the Moog Sub 37 about a month or two ago, but I was usually just for sub, I was just using Serum. So a lot of my subs on a lot of my songs that I haven't had released that I opened back up were missing Serum, so I had to get Serum again. Some Omnisphere, um, a bunch of Fab Filter. Like, every, every song I opened up was Fab Filter, you're missing your, the, um, 
Ozone, Mixed Tap, you're missing Valhalla, Reverb, Valhalla Delay. Um, you're missing Kickstart, which is like an automated sidechain. Um, the, so uh, that was actually a way that I figured out, like I was able to condense what I was using because I literally lost everything. Yep. <laughs> so then I just went to the, like all the songs Bummer. I was working on and was like, yeah. oh, well, I had this one, you know, so it worked out. Well, Sound Toys Bundle, you know. I try not to get too crazy, you know, like literally it's just like sound toys delay or Ableton has like 85 delays inside of it anyways, you know, and like, so try, definitely trying to use a lot more analog as well because, or analog, uh, more inside of Ableton stock plugin, definitely for like live performance as well, because it's just a lot easier on your computer. So if you have a bunch of sound toys and Valhalla's and, you know, and Neutron and Ozone and Waves and all that stuff, your computer's going to, you know, crash and burn. So it's definitely good to try to keep in the, uh, inside the box when you can, you know. So how'd you get here? How'd you get into music? What was initially that sparked you going down this path? Well, I love music, obviously. Everyone does. Uh, and loved folk music. I loved everything, obviously, growing up. I mean, to be fun fact, my first concert ever was Eminem when I was seven years old. So, <laughs> so I just always loved music. I loved rap a lot when I was a kid, you know, like hip hop and stuff like that. Did you have an older brother that my brought dad you there? brought me there? Parents? My dad, yeah, my okay. dad brought me. Yeah. I actually still have a shirt that from when I bought when I was seven that fits me because I didn't have kids shirts, and I was like, I want a shirt, you know. So my dad was like, Here you go. Yeah, I was always into music, you know, like even you know back and I was born in like 92 so you know CD players were still a thing you know I had like CD player and I had like Eminem Shaggy and Dr. J and stuff like that and then it just kind of evolved you know then I got into you know silly electronic music and then folk you know so really the main thing that started me off music that where I was like I turned, stopped what I was doing and I was like I gotta learn this was guitar and that was Iron and Wine Xavier Rudd you know, folk music, kind of very chill, you know, not, you know, very chill stuff. Uh, you know, I got into Mumford and Sons, which isn't as chill. They're kind of, you know, definitely intense. But um, that was the first time where I was like, I need to learn this instrument. I don't care. You know, I, I wasn't expecting to go down music, but I, I knew I needed to learn the guitar. So I learned the guitar and... Uh, at the time I had a friend who was really deep in like electronic music. So this was probably like 2009. He, you know, showed me board to Canada, Apex twin and square pusher. So we're really into IDM and I was taking, you know, I was probably like 15 or 16, taking psychedelics a lot, taking a bunch of, you know, a lot of LSD and mushrooms. So just having fun, you know, and just listening to this like eclectic, you know, electronic music. And then he found, Pretty Lights on YouTube, and he, it was high school art class, like the name of the song, and it probably had like 1,500 views on it. Like it was super small at the time. You know, it was like this was like 2008, 2009. He's like, check this out. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then got into Pretty Lights, but still, I didn't have no goal or yearn to want to learn electronic music. I was like, I love guitar. I like the organic elements, you know. So one time, I was just listening to. Um, Pretty Lights on Pandora and Emancipator came on and it was like First Snow by Emancipator and that like blew my mind because I was like whoa like he's using real I don't know why but I was like I never just I always said there was electronic music and then there was organic music or like you know real music like folk and you know real instruments I never thought to blend the two that was always like uh, <laughs> never occurred to me so when I heard first snow and he had like guitars going and like a cool hip hop drum beat and, you know, chopping up vocals and weird, you know, just a guy saying random things and violins and stuff. It was, uh, it just blew my mind. And I was like, Holy crap. And that was what made me want to learn electronic music. Plus I was very introverted, you know, I still kind of am. And it just, at the time I was like, I don't want to get a, when am I going to go find a band and then have band practice? And, you know, and I'm, I'm not a good singer. So it kind of just made perfect sense. I was like, I'm not going to, I just thought I was going to be like a guitarist and like a folk and blues band or whatever. 
and oh yeah, because I was into blues, you know, I know how to, you know, studied a lot of St- Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix and B.B. King, Albert King, that's the whole thing, you know. So I loved folk and blues, and then I just thought I was going to be that, you know, and not even really go into music at all, just have it as a hobby and be like a psychologist or whatever, you know. And um, yeah, and then found a manspreader, and I was like, whoa, you can do both, like, it never even occurred to me. I was like, that is absurd, you know. So by, by discovering that kind of new door or that uh, blending of two worlds, did you then connect it in your mind? Like, okay, that is that is an, uh, a path for me because I could I could figure that yeah. out. And I already know the, the organic yeah, side. Yeah, that's exactly what the, I, in my eyes, I was like, whoa, like you can use the real instruments. And I was like, I had to, like for me, it was like, which I don't agree with now. I mean, learning, like, everyone says, well, trying to music is so easy and this and that. It's just a different thing. It's a lot more technical, a lot of more engineering standpoint when it comes to production. But I was like, I already know real instruments. Like, it's already it's already done. You know, I just got to, you know, figure out this. You got half yeah, of the equation. Yeah, or at the time, I was like, I got, like, 90% of the equation, you know. And then, okay, nice. Yeah, but I was, you know, so naive. Of course, yeah, naive. It was like a naive 19, 18-year-old. But, um... Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was pretty much it. I was like, wow, this is insane. So I just learned, uh, I mean, to be, I, I own it now, so whatever. I legally downloaded Ableton, and because I was broke, uh, no money, you know, and uh, yeah. it's like 800 bucks. So I was like, ah, oh, whatever. And then just started messing around, and yeah, just kind of kept evolving since there and kind of always evolving. But, in the beginning, like you can hear off my first like couple of songs I released, like Stampede of Life, which is like was an album. Now it's like an EP because I chop a lot of the songs. That is just like me taking guitars and just like running it through a bunch of reverb. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew how to play guitar, you know. And I was just like throw it through a bunch of effects. I was like, this is so cool, you know, and just make it all psychedelic and didn't really know how to make drums really or how to like structure a song or found my structure. You know, I was just, it was the equivalent to just, you know, throwing paint on a wall with guitar, you know, I was like, Dah! throw it on there, throw it on. And then try to sculpt it up. Did not know what mixing was. Didn't even mix it. Just was like, it sounds good in here. Best song in the world. Yeah. Best song in the world. It's going to change the game, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was just a uh, little naive Andrew, but, you know, that's how it started for sure. Was uh, to be honest, first snow by Emancipator, and then right then, that's not much after, probably weeks if that. I found Tycho and Bonobo, and those were like my Mount Rushmore when it came to electronic music. Like I loved Pretty Lights, I loved Apex Plan, I loved Boards of Canada. You know, I loved you know Grammatic and Skrillex. You know, everyone loved Skrillex back then, and loved all that stuff. You know, just respected it as a listener, and then it wasn't until I heard Nance Peter Bonobo and Tycho where I was like, "Wow!" You know, and then they they're kind of, they were like my Mount Rushmore. Of, um, so something about their music deeply resonated yeah. with you. So even though those other things you had respect for, but it seems like once you found those select yeah. artists, you're like, "Wow, that is meaningful and powerful." Yeah. Internally, is that fair? Yeah, to say? absolutely. I mean, there was just a part where I was able to relate to it. I guess it just felt like. You know, I felt like there was some of me in that music. I was like, holy crap, like, this is, you know, me. I loved organic music. I loved, you know, electronic music that was all coming out around the time, you know. And I was like, this is a perfect balance of who I am as a person. Organic elements inside yeah. of an electronic lens, you know. So that's why I wanted to make it. Yeah, it just definitely re- resonated yeah. with me. Absolutely. And did you know at that point that music was your path? Or, or would be, you know, like one of your past. I know you're a multi-talented yeah. individual. But um, yeah. Was there another fork in the road that was like, oh my God, no, this is... there should have the been. <laughs> I was like 18 or 19, dropping out of college and didn't even know how to produce, didn't go to school for it. It was just, I remember clearly I just stopped going to college and was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be a psychologist. I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a this or a that. I want to make music. I want to make this kind of stuff. That was pretty much it. And I remember clearly I was like doing laundry in my house in um, Gainesville, Florida at the time. And I was like, wow, I'm never going to school for the rest of my life. I'm going to be a musician, you know? And it was like, 
so naive and dumb at the time, but uh, it's what I wanted, you know, and no regrets or anything. Everything's still working out, but definitely there was no fuck. It was music, this is it, this and that, you know, and I had a bunch of signs, you know, that I thought, you know, were pointing me towards it and really no second thoughts. Just 100%, nice. I'm going to drop everything and start making music, you know, so that was pretty much it. You told me just a, a nugget about being a security guard and that landing you deep into the music industry in Denver. Yeah. So tell me about that. How, how, so what brought you to to that point and how did you get your foot in the door? Um, so when uh, so I was living in Gainesville, Florida, I grew up in Florida, did not like Florida at all. It's a whole nother thesis. I needed to get away just to be, you know, and I, at the time, I loved the math Fader so much. This is before I was in his label and really, you know, talking to him. He would occasionally, I would send him a bunch of songs. He'd occasionally message back, like, sounds good, man. You know, and I'd be like, oh. <laughs> so uh, I knew there were two places I wanted to live. It was either Denver, Colorado, or Portland, Oregon. And I tried to get out to Denver, Colorado initially, and it just didn't work out. I have a pit bull. They were illegal here. I had no job, no income. Yeah. It was like, I had I had a dog that was illegal. I had no income, no savings. It's not any anyone trying to rent out a place here was no, you know. So I tried to move out here. It was just, you know, nothing, 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 nothing. You know, no one was fighting. Everyone was just rejection, rejection. Which part of the smart thing if you're trying to rent out a place? Uh, I would reject myself as well at the time. But I remember, yeah, I just said, how about Portland? And Portland has weirdly worked out, you know, path of least resistance. So moved there. Uh, Man's player lived in Portland, try to get a hold of him. You know, I was still, didn't even have music out at the time. I just knew how to play guitar. I was the only one that had Tuno be cold enough to build fires. I still am, actually. The only one that has done, like, a guitar cover and released it. And... um so I was like, oh, maybe he's going to, you know, want me to bring him on his band as a guitarist because he has a man for ensemble. I was like, maybe he'll do, you know, Emancipator's octo or six, whatever. <laughs> so then I hit him. I was like, you want a guitarist? And he plays guitar. So he was like, no, I'm all right. You know, appreciate you, though. So I moved out of Portland hoping to be like, become part of his band. So that fell through. So, like, that's a big crush, though, because you, like, moved yeah. location for that. Yeah. Shit. So... That that was rough. So how did you like you know mentally switch and keep moving forward? Yeah, it's tough. Um, I mean, again, I'm, this is all just being a little naive kid, you know. Just like such big dreams, you know. Just you know, just yeah, I'm gonna move there and he's like this and that. And then he was just like, nah, 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 you know. And then you know, he was like this. I remember, there was this one time where I was like, I moved here, like I really want to be part of your band, this and that, just all this stuff. And he was like, hey, I'm not really looking to put on, bring on a guitarist right now. He was like, but Portland, I remember clearly, is a Portland is a very good spot for folktronic music. So I was like, okay, this is there's no bones being thrown that way. It was unfair to me to even expect that. You know, again, I was just a naive kid, and um, I just realized I had to start making it myself. And that's when I started making Stampede of Life and stuff, and was just kind of I know how to play guitar, and I see Ableton as a thing, and that was it. You know, and you know, so on. But yeah, I moved to Portland and then I was like, well, I still got to pay my rent, you know? So that I was, I thought it'd be cool to work at the Trailblazer Stadium, the, you know, where the basketball team's at. So yeah, yeah. got there and, you know, and um, living with a girlfriend at the time of a long, you know, we were dating for like seven years at the time. She moved to Portland with me and it just wasn't, nothing was really falling into place. The housing was falling into place. We we're getting places to rent, but like work, I wasn't happy. It was getting paid like 10 an hour to do security. You know, it was just standing in a spot, you know, nothing was helping towards my music. And our lease was coming up. I was there for a year. Our lease was coming back up and I was like, I don't want to do this again. I love Oregon, but the winter really does suck. It's really just raining for six months straight. Six months, six months. And it's yeah. cold rain. Yeah, it's cold rain, but, you know, everyone's like, well, it gets cold here in Colorado. I'm like, absolutely, but at least it's sunny, you know. So, like, it'll be snow on the ground, but at least you see blue skies and the sun. It's just... And s snow is, like, 
warmer than the the, the yeah, rain. Yeah, no, it feels, absolutely. You know, it's true. Like, it's weird. It's for some reason, when it's snowing, you're like, all right, you know, then it'll be raining and it's like 33 as long degrees. As you get a good snow jacket. Yeah, and then it's yeah. Like, yeah, it'll be like good. 18 degrees, and you'll be like, oh, I'm chilling. And it'll be like, you know, 35 degrees with rain. You're like, holy crap, it's so cold. But um, yeah, so I um, there's just nothing with me and her at the end, and um, Portland. I just kind of did because like winter was coming back around. You know, and I was like, can I do another six months of nonstop overcast, you know, making $10 an hour, you know, like. And you're from Florida, yeah. which is very yeah. sunny. So this is a big contrast. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, they just, and then what happened? All right. Then my friend ended up buying a house here in Denver and I was like, thought I was going to move back to Florida, which I don't want. I was like, I'm going to go back to Florida get my bearings and then, you know, figure it out. But I hit up my friend at a house here and I was like, Hey, I'm going to come. I didn't even know he had a rooms for rent. I just wanted to come and say hi to him. And I was like, Hey man, do you have like a, a I'm going to drive from Oregon to Florida. I might swing through uh, Colorado. Do you, you know, cool. I stop by and say, what up? He was like, Oh yeah, sure. You know, and if you need a place to stay in three months, like, let me know. I'll, I might have a room. I was like, do you have a room now? And he's like, yep. And then that was it. So moved to Denver, moved there, passed, passed the least resistance for sure. Finally made it to Denver. He owned the house, so he didn't care about my dog. You know, there was none of that. So, um, and then from there, I was just like, all right, well, I need to get, I want to get into the music scene. I still don't have enough music behind me that can, like, start making any ripples. So what do I do? I looked up artists that are similar to me and see what venues they're playing at. I knew nothing about Colorado see what venue they're playing at. I saw on New Year's of 2017, there was Random Rap, Desert Dwellers, Alex Gray, Allison Gray, like a event at this place called City Hall. Applied there thinking that was just a venue that had my kind of music. Applied there as a security guard just to get my foot in the door. Ended up, did the event. It was my first event. Ended up being a private event center or something where I was ended up doing like weddings and stuff after that, but it was decent money, so I stayed. And but through there, there's just a giant ripple effect of how I like met more people, other people that knew kind of production and stuff. So one day I was a security guard and I knew the production guy was getting fired beforehand because of some people that I met. And I went up to the boss and the guy who was getting fired didn't even know he was getting fired. Went up to the boss, closed the door, I was like, Hey, I know you know, yada, yada is getting fired. Uh, can I take his, you know, can I take his job? I didn't know what I was doing. My roommate who I met through doing security knew all this stuff, you know, did like huge gigs and stuff for Elenium and all this stuff. And he was like, dude, just say, you know how to do it. I'll teach you how to do it. It'll, it'll be fine. So I was like, all right, you know, and just went in there. I was like, I know how to do this. And he somehow, you know, the guy got fired, gave me the job. And then I was just like ducking behind corners and being like, Hey, how do I, how do I turn on the sound on the second floor? He was like, yeah, this is that, you know, and kind of just learned on the job, just doing it. You know, like, that's literally how experience teaches that I am the, you know, example of that when it comes down to this job was that's how I learned how to do lights and visuals and production and get into all that was just, um, working at, a place called Club Vinyl here and just kind of learning all that and just asking questions and looking things up and seeing what I want to learn. And yeah, so did security for about a year, year and a half and just kind of gravitate into people I've met and opportunities and taking advantage of the opportunity and just, um, yeah, just kind of diving headfirst into that. Going for it. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So was your, the first mixer you got your hands on at a club, like, Mix like with a whole mixer or a uh, sound machine oh, or uh, lighting. Um, not real. Uh, kind of. Yeah. Actually, the club I worked at, we didn't have like a like a sound mixer. It was all just ran through the amps, and you just kind of control it off like a Pioneer mixer, like a DJ mixer. Um. So, but yeah, I mean, when it comes down to even that, like CDJs and mixers, I learned all that through just working at the clubs. And then on days off, I would, or not days off necessarily say like on main floor at the club like on thursdays and sundays main floor won't be open we'll have like a small event on rooftop or something and i'll just sit there on main floor and just practice you know and just 
test it out on those giant sound system and also listen to my mixes on these giant sound systems and uh nice. definitely cool opportunities arose from it so um yeah i mean i really didn't know anything about djing all i knew before i started doing that production stuff was i know how to play guitar i know how to like whack on drums i know how to play synth and piano moderately and um i know how to kind of mess with ableton <laughs> you know and after that all the lights and the visuals and the you know, DJ part of it and the live performance aspect of all of it, that's all through just a fluke of just lying and falling into this opportunity, pretty much. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe exaggerating, yeah. Uh, you know. You put yourself out there, you were in the right place at the right time, you kind of got your foot in the door, and even though it wasn't in the position that you're interested in, and then a position opened that is totally outside of your experience, but you committed yeah. to it, and then you figured it out. You figured it out in time before you got yeah, fired. Pretty much. <laughs> so, so that's yeah. so that's good, yeah. right? That's a win. Uh, that's that's great. But it, I feel like it gives you access to really high quality equipment, and then also just the back end of everything that is outside of just the computer screen and the software. Now you're getting your hands on, uh, you know, physical gear that runs the show, and suddenly now you have the visuals as well that you're yeah. learning. How did you start picking this up? And like, what strategies did you use to quickly learn? I mean, I, I mean, obviously your buddy with a, you know, phone a yeah. friend was a good, was a good resource, but what strategies did you learn to learn all these new tools and techniques and equipment so fast? So for example, at the club, we have like a high caliber night, we have a low caliber night. So like on Thursdays and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursdays and Sundays, there was kind of nothing going on. Fridays, it was, considered Latin night where it's kind of just like top 40 music people don't really care about the lights and the visuals and stuff and so you can put whatever you want no one's looking at it everyone's just drinking and partying you know so Saturdays though was our headliner night so that's when people you know we have big headliners like Walker and Royce and like Chris Lake and you know like we've had huge heads we've had Toki Monster Anderson Pack has stopped through you know so if we talk huge headliner every week for the last, you know, handful of years. So that's where it was high caliber. So point I'm getting at, it was like Thursdays, Fridays, and Sundays was kind of experiment, see what looks cool. Saturdays, you kind of put it all to the test and then you still kind of get the, you know, you get the, um, the effect. Cause the, I got vinyl was on stage next to the DJ, which was always kind of weird. So I would, if I put on a visual or like did something that, you know, wasn't cool you'd feel it you'll feel like a wave of being like oh wait that was kind of lame you know maybe don't do that or maybe you're strobing too much don't strobe so much you can feel it you know so it was really just um you know rinse and repeat learn you know feel off the crowd and just kind of put it going 110 percent every saturday and learning every you know thursday friday and sunday and um just uh trying to put on a good show for like these big headliners, you know, I mean, I'm not, that's not, it's actually the first time I did production was for Bonobo at vinyl, who was my hero. And I was still a security at the time, but like the boss knew I knew how to do this stuff. And I told the guy who I knew was getting fired. I was like, Hey, Bonobo is like my favorite artist. Like I know all this music inside it out. He's like my favorite. Can I please, do the production. He was like, I don't care. He didn't know what Bonobo was, you know? So he, yeah, um, yeah cause out. this was in like 26, 2017. And, um, so I did it and I, all I knew was kind of how to do lights and kind of do visuals. And then like the booth monitors were going out and I had no clue how sound worked really at the time, you know? So I was like, or the technicality behind it, like amps and, you know, electricity and wattage and all that stuff. So the booths are going out. And mind you, I'm next to Bonobo, and he's looking at me like, and I don't know. I'm just like, uh, you know, I don't know either. I'm making the lights look cool, you know. So that was honestly, like, traumatic because I had, like, my favorite artist <laughs> looking at me like, um, you know, don't know what I'm doing. That's good. And I just kept being like, you know, I'm, like, hitting up the dude who I, like, who was working, and he – reason he, there was a reason he was getting fired he wouldn't answer he didn't know it was, you know so it was just um yeah, that was the first gig i ever did yeah it was just uh just 
learning from experience. You know, that's all. Of- yeah, but you got back up on the second night. Yeah. Like you show back up the next yeah, day he was, to, to figure out what yeah, went wrong. Yeah, Simon was really cool about it. He was like, I even went up to him after, you know, like, he was like, thank you guys. And I walked in, I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. I don't know how you didn't throw your headphones into the crowd, like this and that, like, because the boots kept skipping and it's very hard. Definitely you're trying to mix. And he was super sweet about it. He was like, it's all right. You know, it, it, it is what it is and this and that. So uh, he was super sweet about it. And, that made me feel a lot better because at a moment I was like freaking out and I was like trying to, I was trying to have a moment where I'm like, I'm doing lights and visuals for my favorite artist. Like it's so weird. And, uh, I just ended up being me being, you know, embarrassed and scared because I didn't know what to do to fix his issue. And I just had my favorite artist mad at one of my favorite artists mad at me, you know, <laughs> very horrible feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So now that you've kind of learned the full picture, you, you've started on the, we'll call it organic instruments. And then you kind of learn the computer software <laughs> side of things. Then you get thrown into the lights where you start learning all this other stuff. Now you're able to put all those elements together in your live performance how do you put it together and how do you also like keep it simple enough to where you don't overwhelm yourself um so honestly really the last handful of gigs i've not orchestrated everything because really so like the last handful of shows i played they were you know meow wolf so i did like meow wolf and bass the polish ambassador they don't have a screen meow wolf denver they don't have a screen their lights are like clouds that kind of float up, so you can't really control anything from that. That's kind of just the whatever. Show before that was Emancipator of Meow Wolf, two nights, same deal. Before that, it was, um, you know, Meow Wolf Santa Fe. And before that, was like First Bank Center. So it was all these like bigger shows where they have, it's a very strict production rule for the most part, unless you're a big headliner, like a big co-headliner, where you don't get any production. You're the opener you're lucky if they'll throw your logo up, you know? So I really don't have much control over any of that stuff at this point, you know, like it's definitely something I'm going to dive into. And when my following starts getting bigger and I start maybe getting my headline, headlining gigs or official co headline, you know, where it's like, you know, I'm not, it's not headliner me. It's kind of me with the other person. Then I can start orchestrating a lot of this stuff. But right now I'm opening up for these like big artists. It's like a lot bigger than me. I really don't have much pull. So all this stuff I know with like visuals and lights and stuff and being able to time code it, I'm not, I haven't been able to apply that yet because there's no way to really do it, you know? Tell me about your dream setup or kind of synthesize it for somebody who's just curious, wh- like what's in your brain and, and what do you mean by time coding your music to lights? How, uh, what are you running in addition to Ableton? So, um, to put it in like lame in terms, so I want to start getting into a whole bunch of like a coding and stuff. You, there's this program okay. called Thanks. Resolume, and that is like a visual program. But Resolume has another side of it where you can time or not time code. So you can time code visuals to Ableton or CDJs. That's a whole nother thing. But uh, you can time code your music to Resolume, which triggers visuals, right? So if I, this song starts, the Resolume through a time code sequence will register oh this this song through ones and zeros we're going to play this visual now because you set it up and then you can tell Resolume there's also a couple of t- ways to do it but you can do it all through Resolume where you can tell the light you can route the lights through Resolume as well where it sees what visual you're playing and copies those lights or copies those colors rather oh, I see so so you're you're talking about so you got a screen but then you also have a bunch of spotlights yeah. And so you're saying basically Resolume will take what's on the screen and then kind of auto sync exactly. the lights. Exactly, yeah. So that, that's there's many cool. ways. Yeah, there's many that. ways to do it. That's kind of probably the more popular way. It also depends on what you do. Like if you do, um, you know, CDJs, like turntable, whatever, um, that's going to be kind of different than what if you just run it through Ableton. So uh, not much different. It's all kind of the same idea. Yeah, you can time code everything, really. You can time code lasers and you know, even effects like CO2 cannons and fire. You can literally time code everything if you want. Like, not trying to, you know, no, like, it's pretty obvious. Like, Elenium, his whole, at least when I went on tour with him, like, 2018, 2019, his entire set was time coded, like, in and out. You know, like, he did live elements. Like, he had, like, some drums that he would do and stuff like that. But he would have a song, 
and the visuals and the lights and the lasers were all pretty much just, you know, just runs itself. So you could really time code a whole giant show at a stadium if you want, you know? So, um, yeah, there's many, there's handfuls of ways to do it. That's a, that's one of the ways that I'm going to probably do it, walking into the door and then just, uh, you know, go, goes from there. And are you able to do it solo? Like one man, sh- one man can possibly time code the whole set and make it happen. Yes, but you don't really want to do that. You always kind of at least want to have a manager or someone on site who knows what he's doing. Yeah. Because I mean, working in, you know, cause now I've been working, you know, running all these clubs, but I've also like gone on tour to Europe. I've, you know, done shows at Red Rocks. I've gone on tour with like Elenium and stuff and seen all. So like, Something I've learned through live performance is things go wrong all the time. You can't stop them. It doesn't matter what you do. Some things break. It just happens. You know, I was just at Meow Wolf had this outside festival two days ago and Duke Dumont's set crashed in the middle of like his most popular song. So there was like four minutes without music on a main stage at an outside festival with thousands of people there. There was no music for like four or five minutes. I was just there as like um, a person and I like literally like my heart dropped for a sec. I was like, Oh wait, I'm not working right now. Like, Oh, you know, it sucks for them. I'm sorry about the people that are working it. Yeah. But yeah. more of the story is that you could run it yourself in theory. I can time code it all in my house and show up with my computer and this, this and that. But you wow. also need to like yeah. set up, you know, well, it depends, you know, cause if you want your own different lighting rig, you're going to need a whole team to set that up, you know? I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not stuff. sitting there hanging, you know, it's, that would take, yeah. Um, yeah, I know yeah. what you mean. So it takes a crew to run yeah. it, but, but you're able to program it. Yeah. I'm able to program just, it. Just one guy. That's yeah. cool. And, uh, but even then, even if like I walk into a club or a venue that has the lights already set up and I can go in beforehand and time code it all, I can still do it all by myself using their screen and their, uh, you know, whatever. It just comes down to more so like, even then if I'm in the middle of my set, and something goes wrong, I can't be like, hold on guys, you know, and like run off stage. I need a guy or a couple guys there to be like, oh, you know, the screen went out. Why is this? Why is that? Oh, this light's not working. Oh, the CO2 cannons are not going off. Oh, the time code, you know, it's like, you always want at least someone there, you know, at least one, but usually it's a whole team, obviously, you know, for big events. What advice would you give to a young musician starting out today? Get into the business aspect of it. Cause that's something I was going to get into earlier. One of the biggest things about getting into production was learning how the music business worked moderately. I'm still learning and reading this book and ask, talking to a lot of people and friends, with a lot of managers and agents. And, you know, I'm like really deep into the entertainment part of Denver. So it's like, I can see how it all works. You know, I'm also a production manager for like five clubs. So, um, when I was starting off, I was just like a little goober who was just like, oh, I know how to make things sound good on, you know, computer, you know, and it's like, that's, you know, someone, that's what I say all the time. Someone with, that makes, someone that makes good music that does not know marketing or marketing or business management or anything will not succeed at all. If you can make bad pop music, but if you have a whole team behind you who understands the business and marketing and branding, they're going to exceed tenfold over, you know? So one of my biggest things I think uh, might sound, you know, whatever, like, you know, it's all about business, you know, this and that, but it really is like just making music sound good is really just kind of a, I want to say, unfortunately, it's not even half of it these days. Like it really is comes down to know, understand how to brand yourself, understand like your audience, understand how, the works with getting shows like booking agents and managers and day-to-day managers and, you know, contract deals and record labels and, you know, networking. And, you know, so I think a big thing is like, don't wait to put that to the side. Don't wait years to form your sound and get it all great. And you're like, okay, you know, what's step one of, you know, branding, you know, the, I think that's probably the, one of the biggest things. Also, it saves and protects you because if you understand how norms go in the music scene, then you can't get you know messed over by a record label because a lot of record labels will try to uh, take advantage of you if you can. You know, they'll throw you a fat check and be like, 
you know, not saying Lokai has ever done this or anything like that, but um, there's record labels out there that will just throw you a fat check and go, like, hey, here's this and that. And you people are like, oh, whoa, 50 grand, blah, 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 you know, and they'll just like sign away the right, you know, and like sometimes the music's not even theirs anymore, you know. So I think not skipping on the business management side of things and, you know, yes, make good music. Yes, learn your sound. Yes, learn your craft. But that's definitely not all of it. And unfortunately, it's, you know, not even half of it in this day and age. How did you learn the business side of it? You you mentioned a book or, or a couple books that you're reading. Yeah. Uh, well, the book actually my roommate just gave to me. It's um, I think it's I forget the name of it. It's really just called How to Make in the Music Business. If I'm correct. One of the main books that everyone swears by and it's, there's like 11 12 versions of it but like he started making them in like forever ago and just keeps evolving and adding you know ad- adapting with the um, streaming and all this stuff but um mostly it's me getting into the production side of things so through that i learned how i didn't know what a booking agent was i don't know i didn't know what a manager was i didn't know record deals i didn't know you know target of audiences or branding or, you know, any of that stuff. So I learned that all through just, you know, I've been doing this production stuff for like five, five years or so, you know, so it's just been seeing that, seeing writers, you know, I get writers, which is like what the artist sends you and the, art, the writer being like, you know, I want this gear. I want this on my hospitality. I'm staying at this hotel. Blah, 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 blah. You know, that's a writer. It's like a whole day of show sheet of like what it is, right? So just seeing writers and just seeing like, you know, I didn't know what a writer was. You know, it's just so much to it. And it's really just kind of working inside of the scene and just understanding how it all works. And again, I'm still learning. It's still a lot of things behind it. And, you know, you know, labels have backdoor submissions to Spotify, you know, and it's just like, they, you know, and then it comes down, you know, publicists and you know um distribution oh distrib- you know distribution it, it gets a lot more tricky than just throwing your music up on distro uh distro kid or you know whatever they all are called it's like that comes down to a whole nother thing where in licensing you know and publishing it's like yeah it's, 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 it's all very overwhelming in a sense in the beginning so it's like kind of never ends um for me, picking it up was slowly through just uh, asking questions, meeting people, and understanding how it works, and then talking to other artists on my label or you know other artists who are kind of up there, you know. So like, you know, I'll go to like Charisma or whatever and be like, hey, like who are you using for publishing, you know? And he's like, da 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 da. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Hey, Frameworks, what are you using for you know this and that, and that you know? So uh, it's just been nonstop learning and forever forever learning you know it's always it's always nice, changing nice. it's always adapting it's always this and that you know yeah yeah well you've definitely get your hands on a lot of tech and i feel like music is frequently at the forefront of new technologies where do you see things going in the future you know next couple decades any thoughts about live performances um, or... like as me or as like an overall tech, tech wise um tech or or yourself you take it um uh, Tech wise, it's going to be a lot more time coded. That's literally where it's going to come. Unless it's like a live jam band, but even then they can have. Pr- pr- but it could be responsive. Yeah, it can right? be responsive. Like, you know, you can set up, you can do so many things. That's the crazy thing. And it's just getting easier and easier to do it. Like, for example, I can take a MIDI drum pad and I can hit it and that's going to trigger lights to go. So I can be all dark and be like, boom, boom, light. Or I can turn it to do like blue green red yellow like like doo 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 and it's just like there's so many different things and i think it's just going to come down to more being time coded and um i think it's going to get a lot more intense with projection so like if eric prids has some crazy production where it literally seems out of the world it's just like 3d projection where it literally looks like a real hand is like in the air you know and that comes down with um handful of ways to do it but there's like mirrors and there's um let's pick the word for it uh, i'm forgetting but it's just gonna get crazier and crazier and i think a projection is just getting more insane and it's just going to be everything is going to be this out of you know out of the world crazy stuff you know and 
definitely when big artists get money, it's just going to get crazier and crazier. You know, like take Eric Prids, for example, like now, and that's going to be more the norm later down the road for sure. Well, there's a there's a couple other s- songs that I'd like to talk about. So Lavender is one mm-hmm. of them. snare and i find that to be a a interesting choice i i didn't notice it at first but it's got like a steady kick and a hi-hat that just keeps keeps things moving but i i believe that there's no snare throughout the whole thing and i feel like that's a rarity in a song yeah um i felt the snare was of grounding in a negative way um obviously you know it's seems weird to say but i just had a snare or, or i think it's more like path of least resistance in a sense where I, I was trying to find a snare and lay down a snare and uh just nothing really fell into place it just felt like it was like a stutter into the flow like if you know if lavender is kind of like the sense of like a wave that just kind of keeps crashing over each other the snare kind of like threw the wave off in a sense and i just found myself trying to force it for a bit and I was like you know this is really not rolling I'm just going to um, not have one you know and just kind of keep it rolling that's the right yeah. move so cause yeah cause definitely with like dubstep and a lot of EDM it's like kick snare kick you know kick is like you know different BPMs and stuff but that is definitely the the home base you know of a lot of electronic music and I think that's where that's where it gets like grounding. And that's why me and Edamame, for example, we both brand our music as like floating music, you know? So we try to create these interesting drum patterns and intricacies to kind of make it not grounding, make it floaty, make it not something you can grab onto, you know, not like a march where it's kind of like a, you know, a floating kind of uh, approach, I guess, is the way. So, yeah, definitely wasn't a purpose, a, like a on purpose decision. It was more or less just a, um, I noticed it, tried to make it work, didn't work, and was like, well, it is what it is. Yeah, well, well, it is a really, a really nice song. And it, I feel like it's got a lot of symmetry to it. Like the ending kind of tails off, kind of could go right back to the beginning. You know, like you could loop that and it would, it would sound cohesive. Yeah. And I appreciate that about certain tracks that kind of, come full circle and and remind you of where you came yeah. from uh so earlier in the song let's chat a little bit more about your ideal like live setup and when you're performing what would you bring on stage what would you leave out um so if i say i was headlining red rocks tomorrow sold it out and i wanted to get a show top of line well definitely get everything time coded because it's just fail proof and it looks great. You know, that's the thing though. Like make sure it looks great. You know, there's people who try to do time coded at like, you know, the venue I'm working at sometimes and uh, it doesn't really work. And sometimes it's like, it looks worse than if it just was regular, you know, like for example, there'll be like a song, yeah. the song will start off with, that have boat, like boat lyrics slash vocals and the video will have lyrics and it will be off BPM. You know, so I'm, uh, so I'm out of yeah, sync. Out of sync. So I'll be like, you could have just thrown up your logo and no one would have noticed. <laughs> now you're trying to be all extra and you have it time coded, but now you just look amateur, you know. But it's, it's off. off. Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely have it time coded, but it has to be like 200% down. 
and it would just be broken into, um, depending on what my set list would be, it would be different live instrumentalists to help me out. You know, like a lot of my music is not like a man's player always has violin, you know, always has guitar, always has this and that, you know? So in that sense, I, um, would kind of make a set list and have a couple of instrumentalists who would kind of walk in and walk out on different songs. And, you know, like sometimes, um, I have cello, sometimes I have saxophone, you know, sometimes I have, you know, different, multiple different string instruments. Sometimes I have a didgeridoo. Sometimes I have all these different elements. I'm having a xylophone, you know, it's just uh, all over the place where it'll be like, okay, on this set list, I'm having this. So song three, my little, the little string quartet come out, you know, play part of the set, you know, okay. They walk out, you know, okay. This one's going to have a saxophonist, saxophonist, um, comes out you know so definitely bring in the live instrumentalist part and um as for effects and stuff i don't know i've had a bunch of different thoughts but you know like um i don't know it's like making you know how they have confetti do you like have like leaves but like real leaves you know and have leaves oh, all, nice, you know nice. it's just a bunch of different things i've always you know stab that or like for example i thought of one time like inside of a closed venue connect some basic props like a trash can or a plant like something that's like always there at the club have it connected to like a string and in the middle of the set just have it start floating up like maybe just have this part where i just have like this didgeridoo crazy rumbling and everyone's like what the hell's going on and random things just start floating and people are <laughs> like what the hell you know that's always like a that's, oh, that's, that's always good. a cool I yeah like that was that. a cool idea i've had for years and just haven't had the opportunity to make it happen, I guess, because to blow somebody's <laughs> mind. <laughs> somebody's mind, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah, but That's I think good. the main thing would be trying to get into a live band, which, like everyone else does, you know. But it would just be, um, yeah, it just comes down to making a live set, finding the right live instrumentalist, and um, you know, stuff like that. So, when you are working on a song and things are just not flowing or you're not feeling creative, what do you do? How do you get yourself to move forward. I, don't know, man. I, I freak out and hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so I'm like, I don't know. It's, um, usually you just, do you, do you have those negative mental yeah, thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You have a negative, a negative mental thoughts where it's like, I mean, it's just being an artist with anyone, you know, one day I'll think my music's amazing. Some, one day I think my music is boring, you know, like, um, it just comes down to just watch, you know, listening to the same thing over and over, you know. Um, when it comes to mental thoughts, I think I just matured to the sense where I'm just like, just walk away. Don't force it, you know. Everyone's like, sit there in an empty thing and try to get it going, you know, or like open up old tracks and see if I can make something out of that, you know. Um, a lot of times it's just walk away and don't force it and just kind of enjoy yourself to try to do other things or try to do something with music, but it isn't necessarily the creativity part, you know, like, um, learn something new, you know, learn how to make dubstep, you know, I've been just for the heck of it, I've been learning how to do, you know, crazy bass design stuff just for like tipper kind of, you know, psychedelic bass stuff, just so I know how to do it and it's cool. And I've been learning it. It's pretty simple, you know, but before that it seemed that, you know, I didn't know how to do it. So I was like, Whoa, you know, seems so out of reach any any particular insights that you feel like sharing uh with dubstep stuff um yeah with the bass design yeah it's uh really very simple very take a couple sine waves take a uh a saw wave and automate and automate and automate a bunch of stuff over it like literally just take a sine wave throw distortion on it and then automate a filter so it goes wow you know that's how you get the wow you know stuff like that is just automating filters distortions, down samplers, like redux, you know, different kind of distortions, uh, arpeggiators, you know, like that's how you like tipper has this, like, it sounds like bubbles, like, like kind of crackling that goes around. Very simple. You just do like a, a sawtooth on like super, super low on the keyboard. Like, like an 84 key all in the bottom and it kind of does this like arpeggiating skip kind of like something like a static and then you just kind of like take a filter and just automate it around it and just kind of like i can't even like make a noise but it sounds like bubbles and weird like alien glitchy noises and 
super simple and um no discredit to like dubstep artists it's uh really cool to like make a sound you know and just you know cut messing with envelopes and just you know release and tag like something you just want to want you know so you just have like a one hit you know sine wave and then you just do like distortion on it and then like add a little redux so it kind of makes that screech you know and um separating the lows and the highs through an eq and reverbing the highs and keeping the sub mono you know so stuff like that not something i've really messed with inside of my music but it's definitely cool to have the option and just knowing how it's done you know it's kind of the premise of all of it is just understanding how it works you know kind of more interesting to me for sure. Well, I appreciate you describing some of that and some of the insights that you've learned recently. Yeah. And the fact that you're continuing to, to reinvent and learn things that one would argue you probably already knew, you know, how to design bass, yeah. you know, but then you learn a new technique and suddenly you realize that you didn't yeah. know. There is one sound in, in one of your tracks that I swear yeah. is always coming from behind me and I don't have speakers. Yeah. I don't have, uh, you know, four uh, or whatever it's called, quadraphonic. Yeah. Uh, octophonic sound system yeah. but one of them dude it just keeps keeps like it's got me probably 10 out of 15 times it's like i think somebody's like in the other room <laughs> it actually happens and, to me too when i'm making music i'll be like you know <laughs> i'll be like oh wait you know no one's here exactly i'll just be like it's yeah. the chair like, like behind wait. me um that's just from like reverbs so different spaces and stuff. yeah panning I, I don't know how you're able to do it but it's it's definitely like a unique sa sonic approach so when you are designing sounds are you thinking in quadraphonic stuff are you thinking about yeah that absolutely stuff? i mean i'm making music usually late at night and i have a girlfriend i have roommates you know i have neighbors so um i can't be sitting there at three in the morning you know ripping it you know raging yeah, it. so yeah. a lot of the music i do make is in my headphones and um that's just me being a kid, you know, I mean, just being like, oh, it'd be cool. This is here, you know, you know, or just like if the drums go full, you know, stuff like that, or like a, like a down, I like doing like, um, like a downward slope on synth, uh, either way to put like a pitch down. So it goes, Womp. so I like doing, Womp. so it kind of like, you know, or the other way and stuff like that. So uh, that's just me being a child, just like wanting, you know, like it'd be cool if this is, you know, and um, messing with, stereo width and panning you know so like you can make it fully stereo you can make it mono and then you can make it left and right there's even a but the songs you're you have heard that you listen to I've, i have not used it but there's a sennheiser to get the technical name of it the sennheiser plug-in stereo with that you can literally move the sound to like around the headphones so you can literally tell it to go like behind and it kind of does it you know you can also elevate it so you can make it like down here you can put it here or here or you know here or here it's uh i haven't with any of the music i have released haven't used it but um that's another plug into messing with stereo with and kind of stuff like that but a lot of it is just stereo with panning and delays different delays and different reverbs so that's why i'll try to use different delays and not just always use valhalla reverb you know or I'll use like multiple different reverbs because they'll put them in different spaces and uh, just makes it um, widens the song in a sense. If you put everything in the same width, same pan, same reverb, it's all going to sound right down the middle, you know, and muddy as all hell. So um, definitely it's also a mixing tactic to get your stuff louder. You want to, if you have everything, if the song is like this wide, you know, and you have everything down in the middle, that's what's going to jump it up. If you kind of lay, sprinkle everything out in this, you know, sound field, that's how you're able to get louder mixes. And, um, yeah, so it's definitely just messing with panning and reverbs and different delays and uh, stuff of that nature. Tell me a little bit more about stereo width. I've always wondered about yeah. this. Um, so that's obvious. Uh, like, that's an artist integrity kind of thing. Um, like bass sub you always want mono and then kind of depends like sometimes i'll put like my sweeps at like 180 percent and sometimes i'll put it at like uh, a mono percent all right so stereo is obviously left and yeah. right how do you like you're talking about the percentages but like how do you think about 
the width of sound because you know it's an interesting concept like cognitively to think about width when really it's just you got two channels yeah. well um there is an artist integrity part on that sense and it's also a, there's a mixing um kind of thing because if you put your sub in full stereo it's going to be insane every sound system is going to freak out and it will not sound good you know so um um yeah a lot of it so there's definitely mixing you know by the you know rules so you got you know you want your sub and mono you don't want your vocals if you have like a main vocal you don't want your melodies too wide usually want them around you know like 100 percent chop some down to 80 put some down to 120 you know that's where you can get different spaces and you can definitely have them they all have their own um voice we have all melodies so you have like all melodies with the same stereo width and the same reverb and everything. It's all just exactly as I was saying earlier. It's all going to be in the same spot. So it's going to sound weird. So there's definitely like a couple of rules, but then it also just comes down to like artist, you know, choice. Like I put my sweeps at like, and my cymbals, like my crashes at like 180, almost 200 sometimes, you know? And, um, that's just so you can get that wideness. So like when the, you know, the sweep comes in, it just, it sounds like all over, you know, it's like, you know, and like there's all whole nother melody comes in and you're sitting there. It's just like all around you, you know, it's like, it's falling down on you in a sense. So that's where it comes down to like artist, you know, choice in that sense. How I view it is I don't really know. <laughs> I don't have like a technical standpoint. I just kind of go with my, where my ears go, you know, but it would be cool yeah. if it's, sweep was a lot wider you know so i'll be like okay well i'll just jump it up i i've seen a rule of thumb or like a you know a habit of mine where i usually like my sweeps almost full you know so uh yeah and then also you can and, reduce the and then you know and that's where the mixing comes in because like if you put it at like 180 it's going to be louder so you can drop the volume so the you know so that also helps with mixing and stuff that's where the stereo width kind of comes in handy because the wider it goes, usually the louder it gets, but then you can drop the volume and then it's kind of like less DB hitting the master and it's still wide sprinkled across the stereo field. And that's where like the lack of buildup kind of comes in, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So you can kind of sneak in a sound and bring down the DB, but it hasn't really like actually perceptually yeah. decreased no, the sound. True. That's interesting. Yeah. So what plugin are you using when you're talking about 180%, 200%? You can use Ableton Utility. It's not a huge thing, but I um, okay. I use the Mix Tap as well with, um, let me draw on a blank, Neutron Mix Tap. They also make Ozone. Is it Ozone? Cool. I forget. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. I was just curious, yeah. uh, but I appreciate you, you diving into the, the width of the sound because that's a kind of cool Absolutely. concept. As a, a quick naive question, I feel like you might know the answers mm -hmm. to this. Like a, like an MP3 normally is just is stereo, right? So there's a left yeah. and a right. But true octophonic sound, like would you need some sort of different file type? I don't know. That's that something four... I actually haven't dove into and I've always been curious about, like with like, like in okay. and stuff. I actually, I'm not sure. I've always thought that. And I've also thought about, like, back when I was first was, like, starting out thinking of cool live show ideas. It'd be, like, it'd be cool to have different vocals come out of different speakers. Uh, that would be cool. I personally, yeah. you know, helped hook up big sound systems. And I don't know how the heck you can do that because they're kind of all, as far as, like, a computer goes, they don't really see it as, individual speakers they're all just one speaker in a sense so i don't know there's definitely a way but i think that goes beyond my um you know audio uh, right. i, I wasn't it. sure yeah. wasn't i'm not sure, sure either. But, i wonder if there is but, i hope there's a way i think there is but but there's that cool technology though that allows you to have that front back left right up yeah. down uh even if you're only using headphones which these are just two speakers yeah. you know like really there's just stereo but i it's cool that you're able to create that space digitally. Yeah. Kind of like the, that Sennheiser app I, uh, or plugin that I was mentioning earlier. I forget the technical name for it, but you could just like Google Sennheiser, you know, stereo widener. And yeah, it has like an up and down and around and a circle and uh, kind of portrays it in a 360 sense, which is pretty cool. 
that'd be cool to kind of test out the plugin with like eight speakers around me, you know, like eight just regular like booth monitors and just set them up around me and just see if I can just start messing with the plugin and see how it would really sound. It's like a cool idea and something I can do. But yeah, oh, that's nice. what I'm just thinking out loud right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many interesting possibilities. Obviously, it's endless uh, in the music realm, what you can create. So I, I certainly appreciate you sharing everything that you have and all those, uh, you know, tidbits of knowledge, those little nuggets in there. Sure. So I appreciate that. Where, if people don't already know you, where are the best places that they could reach out, follow you, keep up to date with your newest releases? Mm, uh, so, yeah, uh, everywhere. So, like, wherever you use the stream music or you use for... Except Twitter. I don't have Twitter. Um, I have all my content there. Well, really, it's like social media. It's Facebook, Instagram. As far as music goes, it's, uh, yeah, everything. Any platform you use nice. is going to be on there. You can check me out there. Cool. Well, is there anything else that you would like to share that we have yet to get to? Um, you can talk about my, my name change. I'm probably going to have to. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it, man. Uh because yeah, we, we teased it at the beginning and I wasn't sure if you wanted to to get into yeah, it. But we, yeah, so you're rebranding. That's a huge decision. Yeah. Uh, you've already created music under your name. Of course, your name is your name. That's never gonna no. change. You are yeah. you. But how did you come to this idea, conclusion, new direction? Um, I don't know why it, this time is, I've thought about this since the beginning. Obviously, like no one really used their real name when it comes to like electronic music kind of side of thing even like i mean some people do i'm not generalizing 100 percent, but even people who seem like they have real names are using fake names like armin van buren not his real name you know martin garrix not his real name um what's the other guy some calvin harris not his real name you know the it's not even close to calvin harris it's like adam broadsworth or something not it's not that at all but like, it's totally out of the totally out of the realm um so obviously something I've always thought about. And then, yeah, my last name being Rothschild really uh, never helps. You know, um, a lot of people try to, like, relate that to, you know, the, the rich family, Rothschild, and everyone tries to think I'm, uh, not tries to think, but they initially assume, at least some do, that I'm related, which I'm not. And um, kind of something that always bothered me, definitely because the family kind of has a bad rap about, I really haven't done much research on it, believe it or not. I just know people don't like them for the most part. So there'd be like YouTube comments on like a channel that's not mine. So someone else would share my music and there'll be, uh, there'll always be someone that'll be like, well, Rothschild, you know, like evil, you know, this and that. And in that sense, it, it kind of always bothered me for, and I always, and then I would ignore it. And I'm like, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, it's whatever. Just let it go. It's your name, this and that. But uh, it always bothered me, and it always ate at me to the point where I was just like, you know, it definitely wasn't the sole reason. I wasn't like people making fun of my name is the reason I changed it. It's more, it was definitely like a factor I took into account, you know, because, um, you know, I was talking to Keith Lewinther, who's Grizz's and Emancipator's manager, and he was like, I think you should change it. He's like, not necessarily because of the last name. He's like, it will bring a new wave of energy, but also it comes down, you know, people you can't stop people from disassociating you from the richest family or one of them in the world. So that was definitely something I, you know, always that bothered me. You know, I'm from like South Florida originally. So, you know, five pages of my yearbook were like Rodriguez, you know, and like three pages were like Gonzalez. Like it's not even sarcasm. So like, I grew up with like pretty much a lot of people having the same, you know, last name. So when, and I even, I was a kid, I didn't know what, what Rothschild was, you know, like, or like that it was a family out there, that this, this, and that. So I didn't learn that until I was like in my late teens. I was like, what are you talking about? You know, like Illuminati, man. So, um, yeah, when I was just, that always seems silly to me when they just see my last name, they're like automatically related to the richest family in the world. And I'm just like, like, it's just absurd because I knew so many people with the same last name and I wouldn't be like, are you guys? Are all four pages of you all cousins? You know, whatever. Yeah. Are you related to Will Smith? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So that was definitely an aspect that always kind of bothered me, and I kind of would just let it go. But um, and then there's also other parts. It was just you know the name is clunky. You know, like it is what it is. 
you know, some people think it's, you know. Yeah, the S, the S I might have Yeah, missed. the S, a lot of people miss. I used to play, you know, sports, and, like, I've been in the newspaper a couple times, and they would even misspell the S. Now, I even had a jersey made for my football team, and, like, they spelled, they forgot the S, you know. So it's definitely a common thing, and it's like, it's, it, it always felt clunky coming out, you know. Like, oh, my name, it's, it's like a mouthful, you know, and it's just um, definitely a couple elements that went in, but I think the main element where I, that makes me excited, it's not about like, oh, I won't have to see a comment here or there about my name or whatever. It's mainly because it's just enabled for me to, I'm excited about the rebrands in the sense of, I'm excited about the rebrand because it's not me, you know, in a sense. Like, yes, it's my music, but like when I'm thinking about merch, there's a yeah, separation. There's a separation. No. I'm thinking about merch and stuff, and I have been thinking about it for a while, and I don't have any merch. I always felt weird having my full name on <laughs> yeah. a shirt, you know? And then I was like, I can do AR, but no one's really going to know AR. And then I thought of AR, and that kind of reminds me of like a gun, like an assault rifle, and I was not the image I want to put out there either. So I was like, lose, 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 lose. So I always felt weird about having my full name on there and someone else's thing. And, uh, or hat, beanie, sweater, whatever. So with Norman, so it always felt like a narcissism involved that I didn't like. I always felt uncomfortable with the narcissism because I'm like, it's like me, 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 everywhere, you know. And I'm gonna wear my yeah, name. I'm, I'm gonna around. wear my name around. So Northern Farm now seems like another. It's a separate entity that I'm that I'm kind of yeah. looking at, and it's not me. It's like now I'm looking at Northern Farm, and I'm just as much as a part of it as you know my label is and as you know the booking agent who's going to book me for this gig or you know this management company like we're all now contributing to this brand called northern form and now i just feel like a soldier you know or like you know, i'm You're part, part of, of the team, team working you know it's yeah. now like it's not it's an not, island yeah it's not just you know everyone's helping brand me 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 me, me. all this manager's helping me out so now it just seems like a brand that I am contributing to as well. And it just really makes it easier in my mind. And it pumps me up and it's just, you know, I, I'm excited to get behind the, uh, you know, the merch and the branding standpoints and um, can stop staring at my name so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds like it, it, it uh Obviously, it's a huge decision because you've already put out some music and and you have some traction yeah. there. Obviously, that will remain, and you're going to continue that. But you are getting to a start a fresh start, and I appreciate you helping me understand like that separation and how it would feel weird putting out a bunch of t-shirts with your name yeah. on it, you know, and then wearing it as you're DJing, yeah. or, having or, my you name know, performing or whatever, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, in a way though, you know, you're, you're the root, you're the, you're the creator of this music. So that will never no. change. So that's, that's great. But it sounds like you've really come to come to peace with it. So I'm curious about Northern form. What does that mean to you? How'd you land on that? So, um, well, a, a, a quick side to that. I am as of right now, will be changing all of my old music and album covers oh, to I Northern see. form. So I'm not going to be making a new Spotify or this now. I'm going to be changing the name on everything. It's not gonna be like this is me as Andrew Rothschild now I'm making like if I was making like dubstep or you know organic house music uh, yeah if I was turn. making like a yeah. left turn or I start you know making a Caribbean folk band or whatever then yeah I will like rebrand but you know like my Instagram I'm gonna change you know everything I'm just gonna physically change the name and I'm actually gonna really change the album covers of everything too change the names on it yeah in that sense I'm definitely something I'm gonna do um, Northern Form. I've been thinking of names for a long time and I've had like a giant list of, you know, cool names and this or that of that I just had through the years for like song names and album names, and stuff like that, you know? So I had this whole list and it's insane of how much everything is taken. Like so much is taken. Like if you just, you know, I like, just for example, like one of a million examples, I like the name Boreal, you know, and I went to Spotify and went to Boreal and there is like probably like, 14 Boreals. And then that's just Boreal. Like, oh, I have the same exact name. And then there's like, you know, Boreal, you know, this. And Boreal, you know, happy, you know, whatever. Just a bunch of different variables of it. 
the pun, there's like 50 different boreals of different variations. And there is so many names like that, that is the exact same way, where there's just so many, like, you know, people already doing it. So Northern form, I liked the word Northern. And uh, in the beginning, people were like, well, Northern's going to make you think cold, and it kind of puts you in like a box, you know? And I'm like, that's true. That's because I haven't added to the brand yet. Like when you say cold play, you don't think of cold music. You think of cold. Or you think of cold play. You think of a band. Yeah, and if you're in the southern hemisphere, north might yeah, be hot. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, you know, you go, it might be Yeah, if hot. you're in Key West, north is Miami, you know, <laughs> like, or north is still Georgia and Florida, you know, and stuff like that. But even then, still the word northern always does have this, it's more of a mysteriousness to it, you know, like, uh, it just, yeah, it just always like kind of sounds cool, like Northern Lights and, you know, the Northern Pole and North really is always a kind of more of a mystery, you know, like wherever you're at, North is even, you know, to me, more interesting in, in a sense. It's just a personal thing. And then uh, form is just more of a sense that I felt rolled. That was something I was really wanting to get out, something that could come out of the mouth um, a lot easier. I mean, that's something that's not like, Sound. Uh, not something that takes 18 syllables to get out of my mouth, you know, and that doesn't take a second. So that was, you know, I like how like Northern Plum like three syllables, you know, Northern Plum. So it's like, it just spills out of the mouth. And that's something I really liked about it. So there's nothing with this word named formal. And I like the word formal. I'm only, not really what it represents because you think of like tuxedos, but I just like the way it le- looks and the way it sounds, you know, it's just like formal. It's like, pretty in my eyes so um i was messing with that and i was like northern formal and i was like oh that's so whatever and i was like northern form is cool so formal yeah and then i actually made a thing uh like a uh what's the word for it like a instagram post on uh, my story that was like a poll i did a poll and i was like northern form or formal north which are both aren't taken both i can get the original instagram and the original facebook like no one even like random people don't even have Northern Form. I have them both saved, and which pumps me up. I don't have to do like Northern Form music or Northern Form beats or anything like that. You know, it's a small thing, but it means a lot to me. And, um, you know, I did I was like Northern Form or Formal North, and 80% said Northern Form. And I was like, all right. But yeah, when I did Northern like Formal or Formal Northern or whatever, it just, um, just felt clunky. So I, you know, I dropped the AL. I was like Northern Form. I was like really like that. I like how it looks. And then, um, you know, and also it got, so I was taking that more into account. And also I did want to have a meeting. So it's kind of like it's like Northern Form. It's like Northern Formed. It was just kind of seems like it's like formed in this like mysterious kind of um, organic y root in a sense. Yeah, I definitely looked at this name with a lot more kind of what I was getting at earlier where I was you know, like giving an advice to any young producers. I was like really started looking into the producer standpoint or the business standpoint of it all. And um, I was taking a lot of these, I have so many names that I was taking a lot to account and was taking branding opportunities and how it sounds and how it would look on merch and how it would look on, you know, a flyer and how it would look on a festival flyer and, yeah, you know, I was taking so many things into account, things that aren't taken, things that aren't oversaturated, you know, like I Googled every name. But if I went on Spotify and there wasn't already an artist named that, I would go to Google and Google it and see if it's, you know, already a thing. SoundCloud. Yeah. yeah. Or even, not even music related, I would still just go and look like, I forget the name, but it was like a, I looked up another, a yeah, I looked up something. another name and it was already like a big company for like a, female lawn like an online store for like female lingerie or something like that so uh, i was like all right well that, i didn't want because i don't want to compete that's the biggest thing like for yeah. me i've been you know it's actually a, like a, a director of some sort named andrew rothschild who i've been kind of competing with and it's also like a kind of popular personal trainer named andrew rothschild i've been competing with so that was one of the biggest things i didn't want to do was com- compete with another brand that uh that yeah all these things i took with a business standpoint and so i'm like because you gotta think of like google seo you know if i type in northern form is it going to be you know this random company out in the middle of nowhere who's already really big are they going to be soaking up a lot of the the initial links you know so like if you type in andrew rothschild you're still going to get a bunch of stuff you type in andrew rothschild music 
you know, I'll, I'll start coming up. That's also five years into SEO and, you know, playing yeah. shows and, you know, releasing music and being on a label and, you know, dealing with all that stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, that's where, I was, yeah, to loop back around, that's what I was getting a lot more earlier was being about looking more into the business opportunities about it and the strategy into it. So with this name, I kind of thought a lot into it. And I've, uh, you know, showcased it around to a lot of different people, and, you know, and everyone has a different opinion. You know, everyone's going to have a different opinion. And my girlfriend said something pretty cool. Was, it's true. It sounds obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me when she said it. It was, uh, well, before she said it, it was like every name is going to sound like whatever until you give it a meaning, you know, like Bonobo. Like, what is that? It's a name of a monkey. Is it even like a closed or it's like a scientific species of a monkey? There's, you know, there's also a closed store named Bonobo. You know, there's all these different variations, but like he, his music is what gave it the meaning of just a random couple of letters, you know, it's just a random couple of B, B, O, and N. And you don't think of Bonobo, you think of his music. So it's kind of, I was kind of over thinking about it for a while. And finally she said that and it really hit home. And I um, was like, all right, I'm not going to overcomplicate this. And, you know, which I pretty much already did overcomplicate it. I already ran everything through and out with business tactics and, you know, marketing, you know, strategy and something that sounds right, you know, because obviously my music is my music. So I can't be, you know, called you know filipino joe because that would make no sense or whatever you know or like you know Edgar lasagna some random name <laughs> so it had to be on brand something like northern farm just looks organic sounds organic it's just kind of really fit home and again like some people like it that are around me some people are like oh you know it's all right you know you know have you tried this and that try to give me variations and it's just uh comes down to i did you know I checked the marketing plan to me to build the name now, you know? And yeah, yeah, for sure. It and something. eventually, no matter what you choose, you just got to move forward. Like you said, like the meaning isn't there until you give until it something. Until you give it a meaning and there's so, music behind it to back it up and there's a sound associated with it and all this stuff, you know? And merge. Yeah, yeah. And you've already built the, the product. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting strategy that you're using to transfer everything. It's just switch the names. Uh, and then that way you don't have to build a new Instagram account starting from zero. Yeah, it's gonna be a little like of um, a little bit, a little a shocker. bit of shocker for a lot of fans. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna do a bunch of posts and remind people and be yeah. like, "Hey guys, yeah. like, you know." And Keith, uh, Grizz's manager, was like, "Maybe in the beginning you can like on show flyers put like, you know, formerly known as Andrew Rothschild if you want in the beginning." And then, you know, it's like a lot of people has changed their name. You know, like. Um, you know, sure. Chet Faker, you know. People get used yeah, to people it. Yeah, people will get used to it. I mean, it kind of comes down to it's like, if you like the music or not, it doesn't really matter what it's named, you know. It's just, it really sure. comes down for me, something I had to do, and that's where I was like, listen, man, I got to like, I've been always thinking about it. It's always been something in the back of my head. Every time someone comments on one of the YouTube videos, and they're like, rock child, evil, you know, I just get so like worked up, and I'm like, you know, and then I'm like, oh, it's too late, it's too this. I don't get worked up. I'm like, ah, I just, I'm just like, uh, yeah, but it gets yeah, at you. I, 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 I hear what you're saying. Me. And then it gets to the point where I made a, a decision, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I was like, listen, man, you got to either change the name or let it go. And go 100% into your name and start branding yourself and start getting merch and start getting all this going and drop the mental block on your name being on shirts. And I was like, you know, yeah, 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 let's do it. And then I was like, I can't. I literally can't. And I was like, well, Sunday yeah, the longer right. I wait, yeah. the longer, the worse it gets. There's also something to be said about the art being branded under a different name that's not yours. So that way, in a way, like the art has its own yeah. place. And, you know, if, if people are, you know, hating on art, well, that's the art. It's not yeah. you, you know, it's like now there's a separation. Exactly. It's a little less, uh, it's like a project in a sense, you know. And, yeah, and I'm not going to start saying things but there's like other side projects i'm working on that i'm talking with other artists and uh that's gonna be like a different direction with like more of the house organic house direction so when it comes to that i was like well if i have andrew rothschild and then i have like an organic house section like both are me you know like why why is this more me than this one is or like me making a funny video is not on brand but it's 
still me. Like, you know, like, um, it just felt very, uh, felt a lot more in a box weirdly. Like you would think with a brand name, you're in a box, but I felt more in a box with my real name than I do with this. Cause now I can put all of this energy into that brand and I can have another brand. And then I can have just me that me doing whatever. And, you know, and just, I can have my own private life, you know, cause obviously, you know, I'm not huge. I can go to the grocery store and, you know, I'm not getting, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm not getting mobbed. So, but you know, who knows where it can lead to. And, you know, my music is getting bigger and bigger and getting more gigs and more fans and all this stuff and getting more recognized by like people in the music business. So, you know, not necessarily a matter of time, but it's definitely going to get to a point where it's going to keep getting bigger naturally. It's a snowball effect. So, you know, it'll be nice down the road if I ever do get to the, you know, the level of like Bonobo and stuff like that, that, you know, I do have my own identity and it's not necessarily attached to this music. You know, I'm just part of this brand. Like I was saying, I'm just part of this brand now that I am just an employee in, in a sense. Like, yeah, you have Apple, you know, and then you still have, you know, everyone else, but at least like there's still just Apple, you know? And it's like, so you have Apple and you have Steve Jobs. You think of Steve Jobs and, you know, other people, but it's just it's still just Apple a brand. And that's where, that's what feels good. Like, yes, I'm just a part of it now in, in my head. It's how I categorize it, you know, it's, it's whatever. Yeah. But now, yeah, again, I'm just part of this brand and I'm, it's not me, 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 you know. It's not so much yeah. narcissism involved. It's just, uh, yeah just something i'm just working sure. with. well yeah you've got to you've got to put it out there and you got to feel good about it so it's it's i like the the choice that you've landed on i feel like i'm excited to see where where obviously things go you and so excited for for all the music that is coming nice. out is there is there anything else that you want to discuss before we wrap it up um no not really i have a bunch of um new music i mean i you know, talk forever with random different things, but really in the day to day, yeah, I have new music about done and, uh, just trying to get, you know, my new name kind of change over done. It's going to take a bit. Definitely with like distribution companies, they got to update, you know, Spotify and Apple music and all this and that. So, uh, definitely something I'm working on. Just, you know, I have a lot of music close to done and, um, yeah, it's just, uh, one day at a time, you know, just kind of working on right now, for example, I'm working on like what font I'm going to use or what style, you know, and like kind of have a logo down already and just, uh, keep marching away. Well, Andrew, I really appreciate your time today and sharing, putting your music out there in general, putting your art out there Absolutely. and then also sharing how you were able to kind of learn the, the back end of things from the production end to the lighting and the business and kind of uh being very open with the the name change here with us and i appreciate you sharing what was going through your head and how you landed on what you did and how you now are able to commit to it so that's that's wonderful and i'm i'm glad to hear that and uh i appreciate you and, and your music I so thanks I appreciate for being it, man. thank you yeah thanks for giving a platform and asking good questions that you know make me think a bit and not just you know cliche of the same questions you know uh yeah, thanks for asking good questions and having a platform. I really appreciate it.
listening to the Frio Music Podcast with Michael Morahan. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. And don't forget to share this podcast everywhere. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay tuned. Listening to free your music.